Do we have sound? Excellent. <clears throat> well, it's a few minutes past 6.30. I still won't get used to that. <clears throat> it's always been 7. I wonder if we should try it. Go back to 7 sometime. But I don't know. 6.30, a little bit after 6.30. So I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. Go ahead and turn your Bibles into uh, Romans chapter 16. <clears throat> and uh, we'll get started this evening. We were going through a series it's an overview of the bible i think we're on part 18 if i'm not mistaken um, the problem with doing <coughs> doing series like this is you get so many and eventually you lose count but i think i'm pretty sure this is 18. Um, <coughs> so what we've done is we've gone through we started off in the book of genesis and we're up into uh, the books of romans through philemon right now uh, we've gone back and we found out in the Old Testament in uh, the book of, of, of Genesis that, that God promised to Abraham and his seed um, some land. And then a little bit later on we found out that he promised that there was going to be a kingdom uh, in that land vested in the nation of Israel. And the fact that the, Jesus Christ is going to sit on that throne. Um, as we get out of the Old Testament and into the New Testament, we find out that John the Baptist is preaching that that gospel, that kingdom, the fact that that kingdom is now at hand, it's no longer something that God's holding back and saying, you're going to get it one day. He's, he's now saying it's at hand, not yet offered, but it's at hand. And uh, the next thing that was to come would be according to the um, old uh, Old Testament, if you want to think of it that way, timeline, the next thing that was going to be taking place um, after his death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ would be the uh, 70th week of Daniel, the second coming of Jesus Christ, where he's going to set up that kingdom here on this earth. And uh, we've noticed that some things have, have changed, and, and that, that did not take place. And right now what we're doing is figuring out why that did not take place. Um, we don't we don't come to the scriptures and just hope that we figure out that we might be able to get things figured out. But uh, we come with it with we come to the scriptures with confidence, knowing that the words on the page are the issue. Um, just recently, I was watching some uh, a video. Um, it's a movie, actually, I guess, or a docu documentary, I guess. Um, and somebody, some people, paid a lot of money. <clears throat> for the documentary and their whole goal is to completely abolish and obliterate dispensational Bible study. Um, so uh, it was, it was kind of odd. I saw some, some video clips of different people and um, one of those people was Brother Jordan. So uh, some folks are, are paying attention out there and um, we're growing some opposition and uh, it's, it's quite interesting to see how they look at us and how, how they lump a whole bunch of people in um, that don't believe the same way, uh, but they just put a whole bunch of people together and, and kind of go from there. But one of the things that we found out as we've gone through this is the, the main, one of the main issues that we've always, always said at, this, at the start was the scriptures, the words on the page is the issue. Okay? It's, it's not some theological system that somebody comes up with, but the words on the page is the issue. And so all we're doing right now is just going through um, the scriptures and finding out some things. So we've already talked about how the fact that in time past that uh, people were under the law, uh, that the kingdom on earth was going to be promised, the fact that God had chosen the nation of Israel as His chosen nation through whom uh, salvation and, and blessing was going to go throughout to the rest of the world. Um, and we found out the gospel that was being preached was that gospel of the kingdom. And so what we've noticed so far is now things have changed. You no longer have people under the law, but you have people under grace. Um, you don't have people looking to have a kingdom to come to earth but rather we're looking to go to heaven uh, and, and, and dwell in those heavenly places. Uh, n the nation of Israel is no longer in that favored position. Now everybody is, 
God's declared all that's, that all of sin and comes short of the glory of God, that He might have mercy upon all. And we're no longer dealing with the gospel of the kingdom, but now we're dealing with and preaching the gospel of grace. And that's something that's different uh, than what you read in the Old Testament scriptures. And that's one of those things that uh, that, that video that I was watching had mentioned that <clears throat> um, everybody's always been saved by grace. Um, you know, we can we can get into that some other time, but um, it's just not it's not the issue uh, right now. Um, but one of the things that we want to make sure that we deal with here is uh, last time we started talking about the fact that there is a new dispensation. Uh, dispensation is a Bible word. It's not a word that we should be afraid of. Um, a lot of people um, worry if you throw that word around because then you're a heretic and, <laughs> and all kinds of stuff like that. But uh, we've already looked at a couple of verses. We found out it's a good biblical word. And we're going to take a look at, at uh, how this information is laid out, how God chose to lay out His scriptures. The last time after we dealt with that new dispensation, we started talking about the mystery. And so that's where we are right here in Romans chapter 16. And so I want to, I want to start off in, in verses 25 and 26, and then we'll get going. Um, take a look at a couple other verses uh, before we get there. But, um, Romans chapter 16, verse 25 and 26. So Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him that is power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, notice, <clears throat> which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scripture of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. May we allow your words on the page to be the issue, um, not what we think that they mean or what they what we think that they might say um, <clears throat> or what they mean or what they say, but what they actually, the words on the page, we just leave them alone and allow them to, to teach us um, your, your word and, and allow us to understand your knowledge and your wisdom uh, in, in, in what you're doing today and what you expect of us that we might be able to live a life glorifying to your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now, as we've taken a look at this, we, we've already talked about the fact that there is a new dispensation. Something's taking place. And we're going to take a look at that here in just a little bit with the fall of Israel and, and, and see exactly what's going on there. But notice a couple things here in, in Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Notice he says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. So there's there's an establishment that's 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 being that's taking place here. Uh, and Paul Paul uses the word establish here. And, and really what it is is it's to make you stable. Okay? Uh, he talks about uh, in, in Ephesians that, that we, he doesn't want us to be um, like children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, but that we're to be able to be stable. And the way that we're going to be made stable or to be established is we first need to understand His gospel. So we're going to be established according to His gospel, Paul's gospel. And so the fact that he says, my gospel there, that tells us something that, that's completely different. Hold your place there. Go over to Galatians <clears throat> real quick. And this this goes along with what we're dealing with. And, and I know I may be jumping the gun uh, a little bit here because there's, you know, we'll probably get to these verses a little bit later on anyway. But um, go over to Galatians chapter 1. Um, when Paul when Paul uses that phrase that you that that to establish you according to my gospel, there's there's something there that we need to make sure that we know and understand. So if you notice in in Galatians chapter one verse six, he says, "I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that that called you into this grace of Christ unto another gospel." Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preached another gospel unto you than that which he, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again: If any man preach any an, any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. 
Now notice in verse, verse 11, he starts giving us some details about something that we need to make sure that we pay attention to. Verse 11, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel, that's my gospel that he says over in Romans chapter 16, verse 25, where he says, my gospel, he says, that the gospel which was preached of me, notice, the words on the page says, is not after men. So, or not after man. So when we look at this, this isn't, this isn't some gospel that somebody came up with. That some, according to some person, they've come up with this gospel and they gave it to Paul. Now, this is very specific. As you go down through here, the wording is very specific. And I want you to notice what he says in verse 12. For I neither received it of man. All right, so what, what, what Paul calls his gospel, the gospel that he's preaching right here, that he says to preach no other gospel... And he says, if somebody preaches another gospel, then what I'm preaching unto you, let them be a curse. He says it twice. So it's not just a flippant thing that he says, well, you know, just, just cut them off or, or anything like that. But he says it twice. So I would pay heed to what he says. Notice in verse 12, For I neither received it of man, that gospel that he's talking about in verse 11, For I, I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. So that tells me that he didn't, no one told him this gospel. No one taught him this gospel. Um, you know, Paul Paul was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, right? You go through, you find out he was a tribe of Benjamin, and, and, and you go down, you, you find out who he was in that Jewish religious system, and he knew some stuff. And he was taught by the best people. Some 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 people actually quote quote his teacher today still. And notice he says, for, neither, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. So then, this is something that's very particular that Paul calls his gospel. He calls it my gospel. It's the gospel that was, that was not preached uh, um, after man. Nobody came up with it. He never received it from a man, and he was never taught it from a man. And we'll see. Notice he says, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. Where is it that Paul got this gospel? Peter and the Peter and the twelve Peter and the eleven I should say didn't teach Paul this gospel. The reason we know that is because they don't know it. We've already looked at that. We've already looked at the gospel that Peter and, and the eleven preach on the day of Pentecost. We see the the gospel that they preached in Acts chapter three. We see the gospel that they're preaching in Acts chapter seven, and it's not this. This is something completely different. Paul never he didn't get it from anybody. Nobody, nobody came up with it and taught him. He didn't receive it from anybody. Notice, but by revelation of Jesus Christ, it was a divine disclosure from Jesus Christ himself to Paul. So when we think about this, the, the gospel that Paul preaches, it's contrary to everything that he was taught before because he tells us, the way that he gets it is by revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, so then <clears throat> when we th when we keep that in mind as we go back to Romans chapter twenty or Romans chapter sixteen verse twenty five, we've got to keep that in mind. The gospel that Paul's talking about that he calls my gospel. In fact, in Romans chapter two, tells us that that people are going to be judged according to my gospel. So Paul's gospel is what people are going to be judged by in, at some time. And so then we need to make sure we know what that gospel is. Well, he tells us in Romans chapter 1 that the gospel that he preaches is the gospel of Christ. Okay, And so then he, 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 that's what he preaches in Romans, the whole book of Romans. But notice he says in verse 25, Romans 16, 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and... The preaching of Jesus Christ. So there's a couple things here that we see right off the bat. In order to be stable, you need to know Paul's gospel. Well, that, that gospel, we're right here. Go to, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When you go over here and you find out what gospel that Paul preaches, and Paul lays out for us the gospel that he preaches over in 1 Corinthians 15, um, notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you, notice, the gospel. 
So the gospel that he's preaching, that he's declaring to the folks in Corinth right here is the same gospel that he, not, he was not taught of man. He didn't receive it of man. Um, it wasn't anything according to man, but it was something that was revealed to him by Jesus Christ himself. Notice, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also have ye received, and wherein ye stand. So the, 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 the main thing that I want you to make sure that you understand here in 1 Corinthians 15 is Paul's talking to saved individuals, and he's saying, Remember the gospel that I preached to you? Remember that gospel. Notice in verse 2, By which also ye are saved. You're saved by this gospel, and once you receive it, then you're going to stand in that gospel. Don't move away. Don't, don't go left, right, up, down, or anything like that. He's saying, this is the gospel that you received, and wherein ye stand. They're, they're already standing there. They are saved. Now, a lot of versions come along in verse 2, and they change that to that you are being saved. Well, if he's talking to saved individuals, then they're saved. They're not being saved. It's not a process. It's a done deal. The moment you place faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you're saved. So as we go down through here, notice he says, If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Now he's saying, don't believe the wrong thing. And you're going to find out as you read Romans chapter, or 1 Corinthians 15, what it is that they might believe in vain. The issue here, what he's laying out for us, not only is the gospel, but the proof of that gospel. Notice in verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of, of Cephas, then of the twelve. Now notice as you go down through here that He died for our sins. The proof that he died is in the next verse, it says, and that he was buried. The proof that he died for our sins was that he was buried. And notice, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So he, he rose again according to the scriptures. But notice in verse, verse 5 it says, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, and after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Now, one of the things that proves that Jesus Christ rose from the dead is that Cephas saw him, which is Peter, about 500 people. Some at that time were still alive. Then he was seen of James, and then all the apostles. So the proof of his resurrection is that people saw him raised after they buried him. So this idea that somebody stole the body of Jesus Christ to prove that resurrection, that the the body the body not being in the in the tomb isn't the proof. The proof is that people saw him alive after his resurrection. But the most important, I would say, person that saw him after his resurrection. Notice in verse 8. Notice it says, And last of all, he was seen of me also. So, as he says, as, as of one born out of due time. The, the key here that I want us to make sure that we understand here is he says, After his resurrection, Cephas saw him, then of the twelve, then 500 brethren, some of them are still alive, some of them are dead. Then he was seen by James, and then he was seen by the apostles. And he says, and last of all, he was seen of me. The last person to see the resurrected Jesus Christ was Saul, or Paul. And seeing Jesus Christ, that's when he received this gospel that was never spoken of before, was never taught before, and we'll see why it had to be kept secret and why it had to be a mystery, and we'll take a look at that as we go on. Go back to Romans chapter 16. So that gospel that we're saved by in 1 Corinthians 15, that's the gospel. You have to come to the point where you know that, you're not, that you can't do anything of your own, 
You can't save yourself. You can't, you can't turn over a new leaf. You can't clean yourself up on the inside or outside to hopefully get saved. It's just you understand that there's nothing that you can do in and of your own power to, to get that mark that you've missed. Romans, Romans tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark. The good thing about it is, is Jesus Christ didn't miss the mark. He hit it dead eye, bull's eye. And it's our faith in what he did on the cross that allows us to be accepted in the beloved. Now, that's a whole, that's a whole nother step that, that we can't even get to yet. Um, but your identity with who Jesus Christ is, the moment that you get saved, His identity is now your identity. So then, if mark right in the middle bullseye, now you, because of who you are in, in Christ, have now hit it. And you've been given His righteousness, which again, we can't even really talk about yet. <laughs> Because we don't know enough this yet to understand how this go, how this stuff goes. Because that's what I want you to think about as you're watching these videos. Technically, the v, the videos that we have here is for people that that don't understand some of this stuff. Now, there's folks that are watching that do know this stuff and they rejoice in it. And it's great to hear this stuff over and over again. But when we come back to Romans chapter 16, <clears throat> there's there's three things that are taking place. That Paul says that we're gonna that we're gonna be made stable by the first one is my gospel. That's that's the gospel that we just read in First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Notice he says, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Now, what Paul does, or what Scripture does, the Holy Spirit does through Romans chapter sixteen, is it defines for us what that mystery means. Notice which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. So there is a mystery that was, that was kept secret since the world began. We've already looked at this. We talked about it last week over in, over in Acts chapter 3. And, and this is one of those things. <clears throat> Most people say, well, well, how come I've never heard of what, what you all teach? Well, don't ask us that. Go ask your pastor. Why does he not tell you this? Take, take Acts chapter 3 and Romans chapter 16 and set them next to each other and try to reconcile why those things say completely different things. Peter is speaking about things that were spoken by his holy apostles and prophets since the world began. Paul is talking about something here that was kept secret since the world began. We talked about that the last time. If something was kept secret since the world began and something's been spoken of since the world began, then those things can't be the same. They can't be. If, if you've got an apple and an orange, you can't make the orange become an apple. They can't be the same. They have to be different. And so then what Scripture does for us is it tells us, here's what the mystery is, which was kept secret since the world began. But notice, he says, verse 26, but now is made manifest. So there's a time period in which God says, I'm going to make manifest that mystery. And I'm going to bring it to fruition and I'm going to reveal it. Nobody's ever taught it before. Nobody's ever spoken it before. It wasn't something that somebody came up with. It's not... John Nelson Darby is not the person that came up with this. God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, before the foundation of the world, chose to do what we're doing right now in the dispensation of the grace of God, and that's preaching the, the, the gospel that we're supposed to preach, that we're supposed to preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and the scriptures, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So when we take a look at that verse, you know, we, we looked at it the last time. Over in Colossians, it talks about the fact that there is a mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, 
but is now made or that is made manifest, but now is made manifest to his saints. We looked at the over in Titus the fact that it was before the world began. He chose to do some things. And the God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit chose to do this to the glory of his Son. And what he did on that cross. So then what we need to do is make sure that we understand some things real quick. Grab Romans chapter 11 and grab Isaiah chapter 60. <clears throat> Get Isaiah chapter 60 in one hand and, I, and, and Romans chapter 11 in the other one. <clears throat> So Romans chapter 11 and Isaiah chapter 60. And again, this is one of those things, just let the verses, let the words on the page say what the words on the page say. And we don't try to put what we think on the verses. We just take the words literally where we know to take them literally. And if it tells us it's figurative, then we'll know that it's figurative. All right. Notice Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. <clears throat> Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Now who's the thee? The thee in the context here is the nation of Israel. And you're going to see why as we go through. Notice in verse 3. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about, and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to thee, thy son shall come from, a, from far, and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the, of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. When we look at this, the purpose of the nation of Israel, he says, Arise, shine, for the light is come, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Nation of Israel, you're to be the light. You know, everybody always sings that song uh, when they're little about hiding their light, this little light of mine and all that stuff. Don't hide it under a bushel, no. This little light of mine. The nation of Israel was to be the light to the rest of the world. And notice, what happens when you, when you hold up that light? People come to it, and that's exactly what he says in verse 3. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about, and see all they gather themselves. They're going to come to you. The nation of Israel, as we go through Old Testament, we've looked at it already a little bit. Old Testament teaches that salvation will come to the Gentiles through the rise of the nation of Israel. Now, one of the things that a lot of folks misunderstand is Gentile salvation is not the mystery. Right there, you've got Gentile salvation through the rising up of the nation of Israel. And that's what's taking place there. So Israel's supposed to be the light, and the Gentiles are supposed to go to them. All right? So go over to Romans chapter 11. <clears throat> Romans chapter 11, verse 11. <clears throat> Paul, talking about the nation of Israel, <clears throat> and... And we know this. As we go through the passage, we find out exactly who he's talking about. In, verse, in chapter 11, verse 1, he says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? 
Well, who's God's people? The nation of Israel. The answer is, God forbid. Right? Now, as we go down, you know, you look at verse 2. He says, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying. So he's talking about the nation of Israel. When we get down to verse 11, notice what it says. I say then, have they, Israel, stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. Notice, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles. So, well, we just read in Romans, or in Isaiah chapter 60, that the rise of the nation of Israel, that the Gentiles were going to come to their light. Well, here we've got the Israel falling. He says, should they, should they stumble that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles. Now, when we think about what that means, that is different than what we just read in Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60 talks about the fact that when the, the nation of Israel, on, when they rise, he says, arise. Their, their rise is what gives way to Gentile salvation. And that light, when they hold that light up, the, the Gentiles are going to come to their light. Well, here you've got them falling. So the question is, is did they rise? The answer is not yet. Will Isaiah chapter 60 verses 1 through 5 take place? The answer is yes, in the future. And what we see here is, he says, I say then in verse 11, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles. For to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So right here we've got, there is a fall of the nation of Israel not arising. And so what God does in verse 15, verse 13, he says, Paul says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Somebody asks a question. Why was Paul made an apostle? Well, he had to, what? Replace Judas. Judas' replacement was already chosen by, by, the, by the eleven. And by the way, the Holy Ghost. Judas's replacement was Matthias. Clear and simple. In fact, we could go through it and we don't have time here. Um, I think we've got another study and if not, we need to do it. Paul could not have been one of those 12 apostles. He doesn't, he doesn't match the qualifications. You know, a lot of people <laughs> today look, look for jobs. How often did they actually look at qualifications? They just look for a job. You know, I know people that's held out for management positions and they're not qualified to be managers. But they've held out for it thinking that that's what they deserve. And what's happened is they go jobless for a long period of time. And it's not until you humble yourself and just go get a job but what happens is, is if you don't qualify for the job, then you can't, you can't be that, you can't, you can't hold that position. Well, we find out that there's, there's qualifications for those 12 apostles, and Paul didn't match any of them. So notice here he says in verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I, Paul, am the singular apostle singular of the Gentiles folks the the issue that we need to make sure that we understand today is we don't have 12 apostles the nation of Israel does those 12 apostles are going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel in that kingdom you and I today, as members of the church, the body of Christ, have one apostle, and his name is 
Paul. Now, when we look at this, that's the thing that we need to make sure that we keep in mind. He says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. His office as being the apostle of the Gentiles is what he puts up on a pedestal. We don't put Paul up on a pedestal. We put his office up there. Why? Because it's Christ that gave it to him. One, out of, one born out of due time. Paul is that due time testifier. He testifies of something that was never taught before, was never revealed before. It was only revealed to him through the risen Christ. We already read the verse over in Galatians about that. And that's, a, that's something that we need to make sure that we keep in mind. Notice and drop down to verse 25. <clears throat> Romans chapter 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, <clears throat> lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So there's a whole bunch of things here that we, we can get into. Um, one, he first starts off and says, Brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. And then, then he tells us, here's, here's, this, here's this mystery. Here's something that was never taught before. Here's something that was never revealed before. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, that's not the times of the Gentiles. As you go back in the Old Testament, you find out something about the times of the Gentiles. This is something completely different. This is the fulfilling or the culmination of what God's doing today in the dispensation of the grace of God. Now, there's a couple of ideas. One, that there's a certain time period that God puts on this dispensation like He does others, supposedly. And everybody's got this idea that each dispensation is a thousand years and that's how people get that seven dispensations. And that's how people get 7,000 years. Well, that's, for lack of better terms, um, what Brother Fred Beckemeyer would say is balderdash. <laughs> that's what that is. That's, uh, when we talk about that, it's not a particular time. One of the, one of the great... One of the great issues that we have in dispensationalism is that people say dispensation is a time period, is a period of time, and it's not. Does that period cover time? Yes. But it's not a strict thousand year, thousand year, thousand year, thousand year. I mean, the one we're in right now is almost 2,000 years old. You know, give us, what, another 14, 15, 16 years and you'll be there. Then the other idea is, well, if it's not time, then it's a particular number. And when a particular number of people get saved, then that's when the fullness of the Gentiles is, is, is come in. The bad thing about that is, is people get this idea that, and this is, I almost don't want to mention this, but we have to because of the passage. <clears throat> there, there's this idea that since people aren't going out and preaching the gospel that they're supposed to preach, that God is actually using abortion to fulfill the number of people in the church, the body of Christ. And that cannot be further from the truth. So this idea that there's a particular number of people that's supposed to get in before this time period's up is not true. The fullness of the Gentiles, whenever God's finished with what He's doing, the dispensation of the grace of God, Time notwithstanding, number notwithstanding, when God is finished showing forth His long suffering, that's when the time or the fullness of the Gentiles is come in. No one knows that time, no one knows that date. You can't go back to Acts and say, you know, that God's got it in His mind that does God know when it's going to take place? Absolutely. But when this, this, this blindness in part, that's, the, that's part of this mystery too, is that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now whenever that fullness of the Gentiles comes in, 
that's when this dispensation will be over with. That's when this mystery will no longer be the issue. So then when we're talking about this, this mystery here, and he's talked about it in Romans chapter 16, so what we want to do is make sure that we understand what we're dealing with here. So go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So your question might be, well, why, why do you need a mystery? You know, why couldn't God just plan it out the way he did and just go ahead and tell everything that's going to take place? Well, here's why. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, let's start off in... Start off in verse, verse 5. We'll just break into the context here. In verse, verse 2, he's talking to the folks there and says, um, the only thing I want to know about you is Christ and Him crucified. Right? That's the issue. Do you know that Jesus Christ was crucified for your sins, that He was buried and He rose again three days later? That's the issue. Verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now what he's talking about here is he's saying, I'm not coming and speaking in, in, in wonderful words. And I'm not coming around. The only thing that I'm coming in is demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And then he says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. I don't want you to stand up and quote me. I want you to be able to talk about and, and, and take a stand on the power. Notice he says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Well, what's the power of God? Well, he talks about it over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, but he also talks about it in Romans chapter 1 where he talks about that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. So then we need to know what that gospel is, and we don't need to mix it up with that other gospel. Otherwise, you're going to be accursed. Now, that is not where you want to be. When we're going through this, Paul, Paul is very, very meticulously laying out for us that this power of God is that, that preaching of Christ crucified. That, that's what the power of God is, is preaching Christ crucified. Notice in verse 6, he says, How be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. Notice in verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a what? Mystery. What Paul is saying here is the power of God, the demonstration of the Spirit, and the power of God that we preach. We're not going around and giving people one-liners to live their life by. We're not going around giving people devotional sayings that they can live their life by. He's talking about the very words of God written down on the pages that we can read, study, understand, and apply in our daily lives. Notice in verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom. Now there's, there's, a, there's this whole idea out there in the world, in Christianity mostly, that God's working everything according to His will. All right, the fact that our, our American flag's outside, and it, the, the pole was squeaking, is because God, before the foundation of the world, chose that it was going to do that at that time. There's this idea that God's doing all that stuff, and you just never know what the will of God is and people always talk about, well, I just want to be in the center of God's will. And then they'll turn around and say, well, you just never know what God's going to do. Well, can you know it or not? That's the question. I submit to you that not only has God provided us His will, He's even goes, gone so far, notice verse 7, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom of God even the hidden wisdom. Not only has God revealed His will through... He's not, only, he's not only revealed His will to us through His Scriptures, but He's even revealed His hidden wisdom. Something that He kept secret in and of Himself until it was time to be revealed to a particular person 
on the road to Damascus by the risen Christ, who is the last person to see Christ after the resurrection. Notice, even the hidden wisdom of even the hidden wisdom which God ordained, notice, where? I guess I should say, when? Before the world unto our glory. What God chose to do is keep something secret. Keep His hidden wisdom secret that He ordained before the world began. Now, I know you've, I know you've been paying attention. Have we heard that phrase before, before the world began? Romans chapter 16, verse 25, right? The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation, the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. So there's something that was before the world began that God chose to keep secret from the time the world began until it was revealed to and through the Apostle Paul. And that's exactly what he's dealing with here. And here's why. Why do we need a mystery? Notice in verse 8. Which, this hidden wisdom, not just the wisdom of God, but the hidden wisdom of God, verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew. Well, the princes there that he's dealing with is Satan and his fallen angels. You go over to Ephesians chapter 2 and he talks about, in fact, hold your place there and go over there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, notice he says, and you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. When we take a look at that right there, where he's talking about the prince of the power of the air, the princes that he's talking about over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is Satan and his angels. And what God's chosen to do is to hide wisdom in Himself. And here's why, verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The power of God is the res is the crucified is the is Christ crucified, preaching that Christ was crucified, and you couldn't preach that had God revealed what He was going to do through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not the actual act itself, but what He was going to do through it. He kept, he kept hidden in Himself that hidden wisdom that He says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. When you think of that verse right there, what God chose to hide in Himself, the true purpose of the cross, you can't find it in the Old Testament Scripture. You can't find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can't find it in the book of Acts. The only place you find the hidden wisdom of God being revealed is in the books of Romans through Philemon. The only place you'll see it. And if it hadn't been for Romans through Philemon, you and I would not have a smell of a way to be able to get saved outside of the nation of Israel. Now when you take a look at what's going on here, that's the issue. Satan and his angels, they had no clue that Christ's death would pay for the debt penalty of sin for all mankind and open up the way for salvation by grace for all mankind. Had Satan and his angels known, they would have prevented the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. One of Satan's great boasts was that you can't keep a secret from him. And God said, I did. And now it's time to reveal it to Paul. And it's through Paul we see the greatest defeat of God over his enemy is in that secret. Do you know why people make, make 
production movies trying to destroy. Their goal, when I was talking about the video earlier, their goal was to destroy dispensationalism. Do you know why churches and everybody else doesn't want to talk about dispensationalism and want to get rid of dispensationalism? Because it's the greatest defeat that Satan ever had and every time we preach it, every time somebody talks about the mystery, every time somebody talks about the, the salvation that we have through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, every time we talk about how foolish Satan was to believe that what he was doing was going to be able to accomplish what he wanted to do. But rather, God, through His wisdom, chose that event to say, I want to save everybody past, present, and future through the death, burial, and resurrection of my Son, Jesus Christ. And the thing that made it happen was Satan and his angels made sure it took place. When Satan, when, Sa when Jesus Christ was crucified and He gave up the ghost, Satan thought he had won. And I'm sorry, folks, but if you don't have the books of Romans through Philemon in your Bible, you're hurting. You're not going to know about what it's, what it's like to be saved by grace through faith. You're not going to know what it's like to have the grace life. You, don't, you won't know what it's like to have Christ living in and through you. You wouldn't have had that. And so when, when, when people come against this type of teaching, Satan is the one who's, who's trying to prevent what we're doing. When we, take, when we take a look at what's going on in these verses, in this scripture, it's an important thing that we make sure that we know and understand those differences. Um, <clears throat> let's go back to let's go back to Romans chapter 16 and we'll finish up <clears throat> Romans chapter 16 25 he says, Now to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest. In order to understand the Bible as a whole, we need to understand that mystery and we need to preach Christ according to that mystery. Jesus Christ is no longer suffering uh, humiliation um, when you look at a crucifix, Christ isn't there on the cross anymore. He's risen from the dead. He no longer has the crown of thorns. He no, he no longer has people saying, crucify him. But he's living. In fact, go over to, go over to Ephesians real quick. <clears throat> go over to Ephesians chapter 1. We'll, we'll finish here. Verse 20. This is, this is where Christ is now. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Talking about his mighty power, the working of his mighty power. Which, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Notice, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, if you jump down <clears throat> to chapter 2, verse 6, notice it says, and think, that's where Christ is. Notice in verse 6 of chapter 2, and hath raised us up, talking about saved individuals, raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ's position is right now sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And God says, that's your position right now. You wouldn't have that if it wasn't for the books of Romans through Philemon. You wouldn't have that position. 
And it's an amazing thing to think about because if we didn't, this life would be a whole lot harder to deal with. When we learn this mystery and we apply what we learn from this mystery to the rest of the scriptures, then this Bible opens up in a way that you never thought would be possible. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. We're going to go ahead and end off with a word of prayer. Next time, <clears throat> next time we're going to take a look, um, not really verse by verse, but we're going to take a, take a real good look at, a, at Ephesians chapter 3. So for next week, if you want to go ahead and start reading Ephesians chapter 3, get a good idea of what's going on there. I invite some folks to, to join you online or invite them to your house and, let, and watch, it, watch us live online at your home. Um, but we do appreciate you jo joining us tonight and every Wednesday night and every Sunday morning for those that do. Uh, we appreciate it and we'll see you all Sunday morning. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. We just rejoice in the fact of, of what you've chosen to do to not just reveal your will to us, but your hidden wisdom. That there's, there's nothing that we lack. That you've given us all things. That we, complete, that we are completely and totally equipped to live the life that you expect us to live by allowing your son to live his life through us that we might be able to glorify your son, Jesus Christ. And we're able to glorify in that and that alone. And we're thankful for us to be able to be a part of what you're doing. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>